Lions and tigers and bears. Lions and tigers and bears. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. So goes a great line from a great scene from one of my all-time favorite movies, The Wizard of Oz. So the themes of this uh, 1939 movie are timeless, and many people still love seeing the film. I, I still love seeing it. It still kind of freaks me out, though, the tornado and the music and Toto running down the road and the Wicked Witch. We can all likely picture Dorothy and her dog Toto, who, due to a tornado in Kansas, end up in the land of Oz. And if we keep our eyes closed, we can probably see the scarecrow who wants a, a brain, the tin man who wants a heart and the lion who desperately wants courage. courage exactly and each character seeks something in the film and the movie plot is driven by their understandable desires wanting seeking desiring searching aren't such things part of what it means to be alive and and being a human being and i don't think i've met anybody in this life who didn't want something and much of what we want i believe much of what we're searching for as people, I think are all pretty good things, frankly. Things like love, companionship, meaning, a sense of value and purpose. Such things are actually pretty good, aren't they? And for sure, people are searching for all kinds of things. And one simple way we can tell people are searching for things they want is to look at the search engine Google itself. From a variety of sources, here's some very interesting numbers I, I looked up. There's 70,000 Google searches happening every second, or 5.6 billion per day. That's an average of three to four times per person per day worldwide. Of course, you have to take into account that a lot of people don't even act, have access to a computer. And thanks to technology, we can even tell what people are looking for on Google. So the year 2019 has now been summarized. And according to one source, the top 10 searches for 2019 include Disney Plus, Cameron Boyce, Nipsey Hussle, Hurt Kane, Dorian, Antonio Brown, Luke Perry, Avengers Endgame, Game of Thrones, iPhone, and Jesse Smollett. I was puzzled by this. I, and with regard to fashion styles, this, is, this news is just in. Most people in 2019 were searching for the following fashion styles. The fashion styles of the camp, e-girl, e-boy, and, e e and steampunk styles. I have to run out and get some of those myself, I think. I don't even know what they are. <laughs> but I was relieved to find 2019 the top search for travel destinations were Mexico, Alaska, and Costa Rica. So I understood those things. But I found the following to be entertaining, too. Apparently, you can find what the top searches are broken down state by state, which is really interesting. And state by state, here are just some results for New Year's Eve day searches state by state. The top New Year's Eve day search for the state of New Mexico was detox. <laughs> for, <laughs> it's true. For Mississippi, it was find a Walmart near me. <laughs> <laughs> for Utah, it was Costco, and for Texas, it was how to open a champagne bottle. <laughs> now, I know Texans, and I was born in El Paso, so I get this. I thought it would be, you know, they're used to opening cans of Skull and beer. I didn't even know they knew what champagne is, but anyway. <laughs> and there were the searches, a summary from 2019 Valentine's Day state by state. I found this to be interesting. In Colorado, it was chocolate. I was really surprised. I thought it would be find a pot shop near me, would be, but in Nebraska, the highest search on Valentine's Day was Outback Steakhouse Menu. This one was really fascinating. In Utah, for Valentine's Day, it was body waxing, and I'm not, I'm not going to mention what kind. In Tennessee, it was venereal disease, and finally in Louisiana, on Valentine's Day, it was Hooters. It's amazing what people are looking for, but this is really a glimpse of America, isn't it? These are the top searches state by state on these given days. For sure, people are searching, looking for, seeking, desiring all kinds of things. If this were 
not the case. Not so many people would be Googling. And I must say that searching, looking for, seeking, desiring, and wanting is what it means to be a human being. And, and it can be a good thing. And a lot of what we're after can be God-given and life-giving if we pay attention to what it is that we want. But it's also clear that sometimes we can want what is impossible and unrealistic and frankly not very helpful to ourselves or to anybody around us. If we want life to always be fair or if we want people to know just what we need without having to be explicit or if we want for everyone to like us or for the vast majority of people to agree with us, or if we want to accumulate stuff because we think happiness comes from stuff, or if we want parenting to be easy, or retirement to be an automatic joy, or health to come about without a lot of effort, or if we never want to fail in a big way, we're likely to be very disappointed in this life, frustrated and worse. And with wisdom comes the realization that we need to be careful about what we want and what we wish for. What about what we want from church or churchgoers or clergy? That can get us into trouble. If we only want music we like or find to be appropriate or readings or sermons that comfort us instead of challenge us, we're going to be disappointed. If we want to be surrounded in church by only those with whom we agree politically or on social issues, we're going to be frustrated. If we want to find easy parking, or if we want every Christian to be a good Christian all the time, or if we think, or if clergy think they can or even should make people happy, or if we seek perfection in any way, we might as well, we will find ourselves regularly disappointed and out of sorts. And what about what we want from our partners or spouses or friends? If we want them to understand us always, if we want them to know what we need without having to ask, if we want them to never be in a place of struggle, if we assume they understand our values, if we expect they will just know how we feel without saying so. Well, as one person writes, our unrealistic expectations and wants are likely to become our premeditated resentments. Of course, I could get into parenting with all this as well, but I won't because being a parent quickly teaches a person what wants are unrealistic and just won't happen. But with all of this said, I want to emphasize that searching, seeking, desiring, and wanting can be very good, especially if we're clear and especially if what we want is in alignment with what God wants for us. Things such as love and relationships, a heart of service to others, hearts that can be broken over the pain of others, family, friends, worship, health, a sense of peace, and even adventure. These are all God-aligned wants. Our reading today is from John's Gospel, and with the story, we can see that Jesus understood that what we want and look for affects who we are and what we become and how we live out each day. And Jesus also knew that if we pay attention to what we want and are looking for, and if we are intentional about such things, and we're intentional about working to align our wants with God's, our lives will be different and different in a way that will bring about joy and purpose and meaning and love in the midst of it all. So let's take a moment looking at John's Gospel, and first just a quick review. I mentioned several times, that we preach about John a lot, but several times during the year I just mentioned a few things about John in general. Uh, as you know, it was the last Gospel to be written about the life of Jesus. It's very different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It contains a lot fewer details about the life of Jesus. Than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In general, the gospel is divided up into two sections. The first section is called the Book of Signs, in which seven miracles are described. The first miracle being the, wet, the uh, water turning into wine at Cana. The second half of the gospel is called the Book of Glory, and it's here that Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection is described. And today's reading, however, happens at the beginning of the gospel, before the miracles start happening. In our, in our reading, John is baptizing people in the River Jordan. And when John baptized people, he submerged a person underneath the water to clean them up symbolically, to wash them of their sins and things that separated them from God. And the idea was down into the water, underneath the water, 
with the old and up out of the water refreshed with the new. And it's after John does this that Jesus shows up and it's here that he calls his first followers, he calls his first disciples. As an aside, the word disciple means a person who embraces the teachings of another. A person who embraces the teachings of another. A disciple is a person who's active in a movement surrounding these teachings of another. And it comes from a word which means pupil. So in this sense, you and I are disciples as well. We can all be pupils of Jesus. We can all embrace the teachings of Jesus. We are all part of the movement of Jesus. Anyway, when Jesus comes down by the river, John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God. Now what's interesting about this phrase, it only occurs twice in the Bible, and both times are here in today's reading. And to help us understand what John the Baptist meant by this, we need to go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus. And remember in the book of Exodus, when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and remember during that time, Gospel sends a series of plagues to the people of Egypt, including such wonderful things as frogs, boils, hail, and locusts, to try and force the Egyptian Pharaoh to let the people go, which he does not. And as Pharaoh does not let the people go, as a result of the first nine plagues, God sends the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn male. And God tells the people of Israel that the plague of death will pass over any house that has the blood of a lamb smeared on its doorpost. The sacrifice of the lamb for each house prevented death. So when John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God, he clearly knows his story. And he was referring to the fact that Jesus the one was the one whose bloody death was to be a sacrifice for all people. And it was a foretelling that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would rise from the dead, giving each of us eternal life. In other words, because of Jesus, death is ultimately passed over for each of us into eternal life. And that's what John was getting at when he used the phrase, Lamb of God. When John speaks about the Lamb of God, two of John's followers hear him, and they immediately begin to follow. And the two are Andrew and his brother Peter. And as Andrew and Peter start walking around and behind Jesus, Jesus turns around and he looks at them and he asks them, what do you want? In another translation, Jesus asks, what are you looking for? What do you want? What are you looking for? Jesus then tells Andrew and Peter to come and see. As people of faith, as people on a journey, as people living in this complicated, sometimes very messed up world, as people who search, seek, desire, want, and Google, as we follow Jesus, Jesus asks each of us, literally moment to moment, what do you want? What are you looking for? What are you seeking? What are you searching for? And if we are willing to do the hard work of struggling with these questions, Jesus' questions can change our lives because at the heart of these questions is not so much about what we want on the surface, but at the heart of these questions is whether or not we are really willing to be changed and challenged and transformed by God. Right now, God loves each one of us as we are without condition or, expect, or without, ex, without expectation. We don't have to do a thing for this love. But God also wants something else. God wants us to give us more than what we're looking for because he loves us too much to leave us as we are right now at this moment. I believe that God wants to take what we think we want and are looking for and transform it into something else he knows we need even more. In essence, Jesus metaphorically wants to replace the shallow Google in our lives and give us more than any Google search can offer. Jesus says to us, you are looking for peace in your life. Instead, let me give you a new way of seeing things. You are looking for comfort. Let me give you courage. You want meaning. Let me give you my purpose. 
You're looking for energy. Let me give you fuel for persistence. You're looking for economic security. Instead, let me give you a heart of generosity and understanding from where true security comes from. You're looking for a long life. Instead, let me instill in you trust in eternity. You're looking for health. Let me use any health you have right now to lead people to me and the love that I have to offer them. You are looking for freedom from guilt. You want that. Let me give you a spirit of repentance and a new way of being in your life. You're wanting freedom from negativity. Let me fill your heart with love, acceptance, and encouragement. You are looking and wanting forgiveness. Let me teach you how to be forgiving. You want to be free from fear. Instead, take a hold of my hand, know, knowing that you have nothing to fear. You are wanting hope. Let me instead give you the passion to do what is right day in and day out. You are looking for more and wanting more. Help me, let me help you recognize how much you already have. You're wanting an easy life. Instead, let me lead you to one that is full. You're wanting a life without heartache. Let me give you one with meaning. You're looking for predictability and wanting it. Instead, let me give you one that is dynamic and driven by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. We all want things. We all seek things. We all desire things. And that is more than okay. And much of what we want is more than okay, as I mentioned. And down deep, so much of what we want is good and life-giving. We're all looking for a variety of things. And our gospel story today is, a, is an invitation to me and to you not only to really get clear on what it is that we want and what we are seeking, but why and from whom. God invites you and me today, and I hope you will take the time to do so, invites us to talk with God about what it is that we want. What do you want? God invites us to be open to how God might transform what we think we're wanting into something else we never imagined. God invites us to create the space and the time and the room and the quiet to hear God reply to our wants and what it is that we are seeking. So what do you want? Talk about it. What are you looking for? And what might God say to you in response? How might God transform it into something else? Listen. So let's now turn to a time of prayer.